content, the total content eyeballs are the evening with Teasdale botanist Marcus Bradshaw. Well, I think there's a little bit more to Marcus Bradshaw than that title suggests. And there's a bit more information in the introduction to, uh, to the evening. Because, Margaret, it says that you're a nationally renowned botanist, well known for your work in plant conservation. Since the 1950s, you've devoted much of your professional career to the study and conservation of the rare plants in Teasdale. Now, I was going to ask you, first question, how, how would you describe yourself? What? What? <laughs> I've got the answer. <laughs> and the answer, if you haven't picked one of these up, please do. They're on here, signed by Margaret. Because you describe yourself as hefted to the hills and flora of Teesdale. Would anybody in the audience be brave enough to say, I'm not sure I know what that means, Margaret? Oh, everybody knows. All right. Well, I know. I know. What do you mean, hefted to the. What do you mean? Well, I'm an incomer. As far as Tuesday is concerned, and nowadays I should think at least 50% of the people living in Upper Tuesday are also incomers. In other words, I wasn't born in Tuesday. I migrated to Tuesday because I heard, and this was when I was a student at Leeds. I heard there was something special about the flora. I didn't know what. I didn't know much about plants in the field at that time in any case. I grew up on a farm, so I knew about wheat and barley and oats and clover. And what we called wicks, which were weedy grasses. But the Yorkshire Wolves are noted for being very rich in um, native flora. So, yes, I have heard about this place called Teesdale, and actually I've sort of migrated here uh, from Derbyshire. I was teaching Good County, very good county, Lady Mother School, very nice school to teach in. However, I moved up to County Durham so I could be in easy access to Upper Teesdale. Uh, from where I lived in Bishop Auckland, it did be too fussy, but there were two fussy in those days. <laughs> One, then the other. Uh, and then it was a matter of leg work, transposing. Uh, and yes, I started to find out, it wasn't easy finding out what plants were up here. There was a terrific book by someone called Ramsden. Sorry, my memory is quite what it was. Um, which was about a cheese tail and follows from the source of the cheese downwards. And at the back of that book, there was a list of special plants of cheese tail, which are Latin names and their common names. So that was a good start. And, well, cheese said, do you know you really know what the word hectic is? It's more often referred to sheep <laughs> than to me. And it's where sheep uh, in flocks know their own part of the uh, fell where they're grazing and where their mothers graze and their grandmothers graze and where their lambs have grazed and so on. Uh, the area of the Teesdale that um, I've been most interested in 
And Jordan said the audience share of being surveyed part of it uh, is much bigger than what a sheep head would be. <laughs> so we go from the boulder up to the watershed, right round to Crossbell, and then across to um, the watershed between Teesdale and Weirdale, back to the end of South Burn, or roughly the uh, Barn of Castle Standard Road, down to Eggleston, along the river to Cuddleston again. So that's the area. John could tell you how many acres or um, what do we call them nowadays? John, how many? Never <laughs> mind, you know what I mean. It's a large number. <laughs> and the total boundary, 65 miles, 88 kilometers. And to raise money for the trust, as it does, I rode that on horseback at not over the top of the bell, but uh, along roadside using French pony, and we did it bit by bit over a number of weeks and uh, completed the 55. And I've got plans to do it again this year. The whole idea is to do it so that we can have uh, donations, subscriptions, if you'd like to pay weekly or monthly, and uh, part of that would go to continue to enjoy and grow John. <laughs> John's a very special person. He's got a very special talent for doing the work that he's doing, uh, recording the red plants. He's done from Windy Bank Fell, he's done Crompton Fell, he's done some uh, areas where he get, could get a lift there at high level. But not everybody would have John qualities that mean he can do that work. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> 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 Because one of the things that you may see if you do go out to Upper Teesdale in the summer is John wandering about all over. I'm Margaret, wandering about all over, come whatever weather there is. <laughs> and, and that's part of the hefting as well. <laughs> Margaret, I spent two weeks yeah. preparing for this talk. One of your endearing qualities is that you always do what you want to do, and which is great. <laughs> So, I think I'll just scrap that several times. <laughs> and the pictures on the slide bear no relationship to this conversation now, so just bear with me. That's just to test him, you see. <laughs> so, Margaret, right, you're renowned for all sorts of things. One of the things is your tutoring, your teaching in the field which has gone on for years and years and years. And you mentioned being at, at school, so let, could I have the next slide as well, please? Because this one is, is out, out of sync now. Uh, but this is Margaret's favorite form of transport. And yes, you will be on horseback again. And yes, the doors will open later, after you've pledged your foundation. <laughs> um, but you and horses go back a long time, and I, I think they, they probably go back to those early days on the farm uh, with your twin brother in the Yorkshire Wolves. Could I have the next slide, please, just to give us some orientation? So, Margaret, what were those days like on, 
on the farm in your early days? Is that where your love of horses and, and plants came? I don't know. Uh, in some ways, I think um, <coughs> love, I don't choose that word, but my interest in plants, I don't know, it just seemed to be the innate. And same with the horses. Uh, obviously, when you think I'm 97 now, so if you think back to when I was young, the lot of the um, horsepower on farms was literally four leg type of horsepower. And so I grew up before the Second World War be well acquainted with all the cart horses on the farm. And, um, oh yeah, I love a lot of pony to ride. I wasted a lot of time telling my father I wouldn't. <laughs> no bail, no bail. Farming was hard. It was a very big farm. And although we did have too bad that the shepherd working on the farm. My father worked as hard as they did. And muggings had to stay in the kitchen, the help in the house. My twin brother got out on the farm. Well, I would have liked to be. Uh, so, as for plants, I don't know. I just don't know. There wasn't any encouragement from home. Plants were the coffee and were the plants in the fields that produced food, either directly or by sheep or cattle or cows. Now you went you went to school in Bridgerton, which was a, a bit of a trek, uh, mm -hmm. because you were based in Driffield. So you went to school in, in Bridgerton, and then you went one day a week to Hull, to a school in Hull. Oh, uh, well, yes. Um, we lived five miles out of Driffin, where our relatives, my brother and I stayed there during the week. We went by train daily to um, Bridlington. Oh, no, 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 no. Short train with a long TV, more coaches, and as it came from Malton, we used to call it the Malton Dunker. <laughs> it went off one day without the guard. <laughs> <laughs> so you go back again. And what was most infuriating for some of us was that that was the first day of term when we would have got a chance to choose our destiny. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bridlington, it was a good school in many ways. And in the sixth form, um, our biology mistress was not well in the autumn term. But our senior English person shared a flat with a senior biologist at the school they owned. And so the arrangement was that we six formers would go to Hull each Friday. And I met, um, this was good, I met a, someone who was teaching us called Miss Hepburn. Miss <coughs> Susan here. No, okay. <laughs> I met Miss Hepburn and she was quite different from my regular biology teacher and um, really quite inspiring. Um, yeah. And that inspiration was key, as it is to all of us. So we'll move on. The next slide is Leeds University. You told us that you went there and then you moved on to do teacher training. Your first teaching post was in the um, Derbyshire. Derbyshire, and then you moved to Bishop Auckland, and then Bishop Auckland, you 
started, as you're told, there's a couple of buses and legging up into the hills, botanizing. But there was another inspirational character came along at that time, Max Walker. Yes, uh, you see I've dedicated the book to Max Walkers. He was um, in charge of the herbarium section, but also a lecturer in Cambridge University. And uh, he and I think another two or three people had linked up with Cambridge Local Seedicus Examination Board to include an element of field work with the, um, what do you call them, higher school certificate? Yes, higher school certificate of botany and zoology. And um, at that time, uh, sorry, at that time, some of that little group visited schools that had entered their um, DC, uh, higher level uh, GCSE into doing this voluntary. It was voluntary, it was extra. And I remember trying to persuade the sixth form that it'd be a good idea if they got it. It might just make the difference between one grade and the next grade um, in their exam. And um, at that year, that first year I was at school, um, Dr. Max Wilkins came to their, their dissertation they produced in being sent in advance, and he pressed bouts of being sent. And, um, Max, as I got to know him, uh, Max came up and uh, uh, interviewed the students and interviewed the staff, <laughs> talked to the staff, in other words, and Max suggested maybe I would like to look at Alphabella species as he found some uh, special ones in these days. I think there was an Alphabella one, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> and he sent me a publication with a key in it, and henceforth that summer I spent trying to learn them. There are nine different ones in Teasdale. And it was no easy matter on my own getting to know what they were, though I did use the same weekly parcels up to Max to be identified. <laughs> and at the end of the season, I thought, God, I'm not going to learn these terms. But next spring, they just fell into place. And that's the way education goes, actually. You struggle, you have a break, you come back to it, and lo and behold, it all seems to be clear. Uh, yeah. And I think that's a wonderful um, message for, for everybody as a beginner botanist or uh, at whatever level. It takes time. It, 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 it doesn't, it doesn't time. happen overnight. But if you look at the uh, plant crib references on the screen, you'll see that Margaret has spent quite a lot of time <laughs> on Alphabella. And discovered quite a lot of new alphamillas, or undiscovered alphamillas in Upper Teesdale and in Weirdale as well. And the plant crib is there to help everyone identify the difficult uh, individual species. And you'll also notice Max bought his name there as well. Yes, I, <coughs> I had book launch on the 3rd of March and I was delighted to welcome Max Walter's younger son, called Martin, uh, and he actually came to that meeting, which was great. I also, oh, there were a number of people I hadn't seen for 40 years. 
and you don't. A lot more local people. We finished up with eighty people there, which was absolutely wonderful. In High Falls Hotel, by courtesy of Lord Barbard, and he kind of fixed the bill. <laughs> <laughs> it was very nice. And what was, what was Lord Barbard talking about? Margaret, he told us about riding the pony around to collect money. What was, yeah. what was Lord Barnard talking about you wanting to do something at Grady Castle? What, what was all that about? <laughs> this was just before Corbett, and I'd established the uh, GZ Special Flora Research and Conservation Trust in 2017. Uh, to gather more information about exactly where the rare plants grew in Upper Teesdale and also to try and get more people interested in recognising there was something special there. And what's more, that they should sort of feel they open gates because it's something special about Upper Teesdale. Something that the people in Upper Teesdale ought to feel proud about. Even if they don't know more than the gates of Birds Eye Primrose or Mountain Avons, the most <coughs> obvious ones. But totally, total, it's the fear, it's the, in the, sorry, I'm trying to talk too fast. <laughs> Excuse me. I am Hudson. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's in the top ten, ten sorry, the top five um, in most important plant special areas in the country. With the there are other places with collections of all the rare plants. They've all got some things special about them. The main one is that they're open habitats. They've not been covered by trees. Even from the glacial times onwards through the forest maximum, as some of you know about it, they still were growing in places not completely covered by trees and also they grew like an element of base richness, sorry, base richness, alkalinity in the soil and substrate. But cheese there is one of the top five. Um, yes, I would love it if there was a a good size body of people, we might call them the friends of the Teesdale flora, that would think it was important and help to take care of it, help to educate people of what's there. And a lot of these are little plants that are easily damaged. But still, you've got such beauties that are That's the Teesdale Gentian uh, or Spring Gentian. This is Martin Rogers' photograph. The colour is fantastic. And I hope a lot of you will see them in the spring. You need to go up after there's been a week of weather like we've had today, and then you suddenly <laughs> get a nice sunny day. And all the flowers that have been queuing up to open will be open, and it gives you a false impression that there's an awful lot of them there. <laughs> Whereas I have seen in the 15 years I've been going up, and it's a lot of some of that time keeping careful records. Uh, Lizzie Madison is doing some of the recording now. Uh, some of you might know her, she's up in Allendale. 
uh, as we know that the numbers have declined. I have people surveying 20 or more bees tails right across the Sugar Line Stone, uh, whilst the dam was being built, Cold Green Reservoir Dam, using money provided by ICI, at least we used a bit of it. And uh, we, we had maps of these pieces, and they formed a baseline. And John, when he did his recording of Revamp Bell, could compare the two. And those little booklets that are out, you see there are figures in there of the decline in numbers. It's serious. And the other thing just at the moment that is frustrating, I find, is that uh, I think it's natural in England, it could be different, but there is a grant out for species recovery. This is species uh, at the edge of extinction. But they are only taking species that are in category 8, that are nationally rare, nationally rare. And a lot of the tea day species, apart from Bob Sandworth, which only grows in tea sales, have got a much wider distribution either in Scotland or the southern species further south. Teesdale is at a, a boundary zone, a border zone between north and south. That's what England is trying to protect the south. The, it's a combination of Arctic alpine and the southern species that makes Teesdale so special. And yet, because most of the species are more abundant either to, up to the south, we can't get money from that branch to do anything about the Teesdale species. And they freaked out. And money, sadly, is one of the important keys. So we're going to, we're going to um, let some young people have some questions, but I'm going to come back not going to let you off the hook. You were trying to collect money, and Lord Barnard was not particularly happy with you. Because what did you want to do at Brady Castle to raise money? Come on, when, when, when I started the trust, we wanted to have a proper loans to raise money. And I forgot the how Brady Castle got mentioned, but I said, well, they'd be great if I could exile from <laughs> Chippen Tower. <laughs> That's the tallest bit of the castle. I have done some abseiling before. I'm just rock climbing. So I knew I'd be quite happy doing the rock climbing, doing the abseiling. And you were only 95 at the time, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> you were only a young man. I put this to Lord Barbard. And he didn't say no. So, right. <laughs> and things progressed. And I dare say, when Lord Barnard himself, plus some of the castle staff, that explored how many floors one would have to, you know, some extent of stairs one would have to go up. And then finally the last bit, and this was up a wooden ladder, which I don't know whether anyone had been up it for years, and out through uh, a smallish opening to get up onto the top of Trivet Tower. Uh, I, I forgot who was with me, probably Tom Blenheim, 
um, we have tried to get the photo rescue team involved. I have twice, twice done the Great North Road and raised money for the photo rescue, as I was a member when it first started. So I thought they would help us. Eventually, they came back and said they wouldn't be able to get insurance for it. <laughs> so what with the lack of insurance and a, a rather uncertain ladder to the top bit, we had to call it off. <laughs> and then Paul <laughs> came on the whole lot <coughs> No more ideas like that, Margaret. We have to move on to invite Lisa and Meg and James and Ho Yin, who are the next generation to take forward the teaser. So, please come on. Who's going to speak first? I wanted to ask you, Margaret, how to do <laughs> How we and other aspiring conservationists and botanists can get involved and in what we can do to help continue the fantastic work that you've done today. Uh, good question. <laughs> well, um, please don't, please don't. One thing that we always wanted to raise some money for the trust. Um, it's amazing how it disappears. <laughs> he doesn't come cheap. <laughs> 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 yeah. I do. I'm trying to think how you could how you could help in a practical way, which I think is what you're thinking about. Um, one thing which is not, can I have that? Which is not directly with the red plants on the fell, but um, Archimelo Mollis, <laughs> soft ladies, mantle, beloved of God knows um, floral arrangers. But not beloved by me. <laughs> uh, this is a foreign species from the Crimea area, which is uh, brought, brought in as a garden plant. But like all ladies mantles, it produces lots of fertile seed. It doesn't need to be pollinated, it doesn't need to be insects. You know, it does it all by itself. Um, lots of fertile seed, lots of seedlings, and uh, people with gardens often, you know, get tired of it and they throw it down the local stream and so on, focus. The other thing is these seeds are small and persistent, and I'm wondering if they get caught up in gardener's footwear. I'm not so sure about whether dogs would spread it, probably not, but I think it could be spread. And there are places, this horrifies me, there are places in Craven District, limestone area, open woodland that could have rare native mantles in it, which are now solid with um, crevice wallets. So if you could, if you could record where you find it, I know it grows on the side of the Harwood Beck in Upper Teesdale. Um, the photograph over here is here, uh, is down in the Craven District. I'm told there are solid patches in Keelida Forest. It's, it's, um, it's a plant, it doesn't need to have special limestone flora, uh, sorry, uh, special limestone substrate. 
it's growing a wide range of soils. So tea the forest, limestone, woodland, and clay. Land. But if you could record it, we do have somebody who's putting all these records together. That would give um, ammunition, strength to your elbows to get the local council to do something about it. And last year the government gave grants to the local councils, I know Durham County Council, um, to um, control invasive, aggressive invasive species, mostly old ones. Things like um, impetians, impetians, Himalayan balsam, and that tall uh, umbilica, a hogweed. But you could, you could look out for these. Um, if you like, I could, yeah, I could. <laughs> Sorry, I could send you uh, the botany groups some of field work, but these are Monday nights, so it's probably a bit awkward for you. <laughs> you know, it's one thing tuning in to a Zoom meeting. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Margaret. I'm sure some of us so you've answered all the questions I actually had in my head in that one sentence. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> but picking up on the field of invasive species, are there any other non-native plants which are spreading and endangering the flora of Teesdale? Is it just our Camilla Morris um, that's a problem? Or? Yeah, you think of the old Camilla Morris green towns and possibly getting into meadows. Um, the other, the other area of species I can think of that by the streams is, oh, I call it an epilobium, it isn't, it's got it's a different genus. Um, some of you may have seen it on streams, it prostrates plants. Um, no, 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 I don't know where involved in there. No, this is possibly growing down, but it, it looks like a little willow herb, but the stems are horizontal, and uh, you see him persons growing up like that. New Zealand willow herb. Hmm? New Zealand willow herb. Yes, that's right. But, uh, but I don't know, John, would you think it was much of a threat? It seems to grow in kind of areas that would otherwise be open a lot of the time. Yes. So I don't know if it pushes out other plants. Yeah, it does grow in the kind of open gravelly areas by streams that a number of the rare plants like. I've not encountered it in the world where it was really being a threat. The easiest way to see it, if you go up to these days and go park at Calgary Reservoir Car Park, walk along the nature trail towards the dam, and at the second stream, there's a... Um, um, they made it so water can go under the road. If you look at the little embankment, well, it's in the embankment, but the little wall up the side, you can see it there, full summer and autumn, it is perennial, but uh, when it's cruising, it's easier to see. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about the Plants on the Edge project, the, the Plants on the Edge project, and whether that's helped to engage younger people in botany. Uh, it would do the the public engagement side, uh, have we? They, they, we've got a public engagement officer who's been working with 
some of the Teesdale schools, uh, more the primary schools than the secondary, but the uh, two lots with secondary ones. Uh, it's been a bit limited, but yes, we've had contact there, and I hope we'll go on because we've got money until June. <laughs> Yeah, so um, what do you think is your biggest challenge to the conservation of the uh, flora in Teesdale so far? The biggest challenge? Lack of money. <laughs> <laughs> Lack of money for that from England who are, in, are supposed to manage the nature reserve. Uh, a large proportion of the area that John covers is in fact within nature reserve. And then you've got to bear in mind that neither the neither Natural England nor the Trust own any of the land. So all the land is owned by someone else, be it Lord Barnard on the Durham side, uh, the Earl of Strathmore on the other side, uh, someone who's got a large part of the shooting area on the old Yorkshire side. Uh, there are individual farms that, and properties that are owned by the people uh, who, who live there. So, when, when you want to get some agreement about doing something, like getting extra grazing on the limestone on Windbound Fell, right, you've got to talk to Natural England, or, um, Officer in charge, Martin, Martin Fergus. Uh, then there's the tenant farmer. And then, uh, yes, you've got to have contact with the gamekeeper, head gamekeeper, and Lord Wildland, of course, maybe to his agent. Uh, so there's a, a lot of people that what one has to get agreements with, but it does come down to naturally they're having money to do things or there being um, support for the farmers and get them to encourage to do them. Um, does that help? <laughs> Uh, I think, I think also it would be very good if we did have, as I've been saying, a body of local people who really care about the area, because you know what it's like if a lot of people do care about something, you know, they move mountains. <laughs> and Lord Barnard's not unsympathetic, you know, and I think also there's a bit of a, I hope, a bit of a turning of the tide. Um, the war in Ukraine, the um, fuel, the carbon footprint, I hope, and you know, sometimes I wonder whether it's worth worrying about the tea tail floor. <laughs> We've got a big worldwide problem. Yeah, absolutely. We've right, got right. a, sorry, we have a worldwide problem, and I wish Hulk out David Attenborough and the maker of those sort of films would realise that plants are the basis of things. It's only plants that can capture energy from 
outside our system and bring it into a system that can start the bottom of the food chain that feeds you and me and all the animals. And even in the sea, apart from these uh, deep ocean beds where you've got uh, special bacteria that can make use of the chemicals that come up. It must be a wonderful soup of chemicals there that they make use of that do eventually produce some food for fish, but a lot more of the fish food would start off as something uh, from green plants that have captured energy from the sun. <coughs> It's very hard trying to try to look after one's own carbon footprint. But there are other much bigger carbon footprints that I don't know, they need, need attention, but I'm 97 as I said, I don't expect to have many more years, but you people and a lot of others here, you are going to live through this next stage. They could frighten me. <laughs> but you're not I don't know if any of you heard it. I don't know whether I read it or heard it, but Chris Packham, who was being involved in the Spring Watch, etc., and other things, He's taking a sabbatical. He's taking time off. And it was the article then that he was written in, I think in the Radio Times, and he said he was taking this time off. And he said he was frightened. And I think he means what I've just been talking to you about. However, as some say, and I think David Attenborough says, all is not lost, there's still time if the right kind of action is taken. But it needs to be worldwide. But it's a bit like a journey. I was looking at a, at an article I'd written. It was my presidential address to the Yorkshire Naturalist Union. And one of the things if you're made president is you've got to give an address. <laughs> Fortunately, I had all that work that people had done recording the plants on Wigman Fell, so I drew all of that together. And along the top I've written that a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. So each little thing that can be done. And I would say, I was thinking about this to you young people and the young people in the audience. If you are really very bright, I'm not, but if you're really very bright and you know you want to work on plants, and maybe you know you want to work on plants in Teesdale, Okay, set your focus and follow that track, get all the help you can. If you're not so bright but you're <laughs> interested, <coughs> take the opportunities that come along. You see, I heard this as a second year student and I missed out from a visit to Teesdale because, believe it or not, I, I was a bit timid, I think. I think I lacked confidence. I didn't. There was too much unknown. I didn't know what all of this would have involved. Staying at the youth hostel, I knew nothing about the youth hostel, you see. So I didn't go. The path not taken. However, I 
hung on to my idea of Teasdale. Don't know why, but I did. I, I finished seventh this fourth in school, met Max Walters, and that changed. You know, I was just fortunate. I met that person. He suggested on Castor Road Mellon, but it led on to more than that. And I joined the Botanic Society in Rich Shiles. I used to go and stay with the Walters family, and that always meant more botanizing with Max, more work in the herbaria. And I took the opportunity, you know. So if you if you could really set your sights and say, I'm good luck to you. Otherwise, take the opportunities that come along. You don't know where they're going to lead you. I'm any more people, and they need to be as young as these ones here. <laughs> any of you. <laughs> any of you, you're never too old. Margaret, you spent an hour with this. You could, you could, we could spend three, four, five hours with this. It's absolute privilege. You've told us about a very special place up at Tearsdale. One of the five top botanical hotspots in Britain and Ireland. There's one botanical hotspot or hot botanist in Britain and Ireland. And fortunately, that lady is the champion of the flora Margaret Bradshaw, you are a total star. <laughs>